Good morning, everyone. What a wonderful, blessed day it is. And um, you know, when you miss a Sabbath being here, you don't understand how hard it is to deal with when you miss all the wonderful smiling faces that you see every Sabbath morning. <clears throat> you know, this morning uh, when I heard the special, uh, the interlude music, Amazing Grace, it made me think of bagpipes. Anybody, does that come to mind for anybody? Bagpipes, that's a song I, I absolutely love to hear on bagpipes. You know, and um, Sister Cheryl, thank you for your prayer this morning, including me. I think that uh, what I have to say this morning may require the support of that wonderful prayer. Um, and uh, our young man who read the scripture, what a wonderful way of putting that across with such a, such a very um, serious piece of scripture by a young man. This morning, as you know, I, I was away, and when you go away, people say, well, how was it? Right? When I come back, I'm smipping, how was it? Well, you know, uh, where we were um, was uh, on the south, southwest coast of Mexico. And um, we were there three generations, me being at the top of the ladder, if you want to count your way down. But uh, as we were there, you know, uh, it was one morning uh, my, my, uh, my son-in-law said to me, uh, in the evening, he says, uh, we should go deep sea fishing. And there, there's a couple things about that that were wrong for me. Uh, two things were wrong with me. One was deep, the other was sea. Um, and they said, oh, you know, I said, no, I'll, I'll, I won't bother with, I will bow out of that. You guys can go, there's three, it's no problem, you can go, it's okay. But you know, Brother Ben, young men say things like, what are you, too old, right? And what happened? I said, sign me up. So the next morning, before six o'clock in the morning, I found myself sitting in a small boat off the, off the dock. I saw some bigger boats, and I initially thought that we were going to be in one of the bigger boats, because that one felt okay to me. But they say, you're only a party of four, so you're in, and they point to another boat, which made me completely nervous. This boat was so narrow, I could touch both sides by stretching my hands out. And so I started looking for the life jacket, because they said deep, and they said sea, and they said small boat. Well, you know, um, when he goes to fishing, I don't know anybody who's fished before, uh, I'm not a fisherman, but since I was there, I thought, okay, I would, I would fish. And they would throw the, they would bait the line and throw it overboard. And they'd tell you when to grab the line and to pull in, right? So they said to me, since you're the senior person on the boat, right, Brother Ben, great, right title, you get the first fish that pulled on the line. So when the, the line started to do something like this, they said, you're up. So I got and I started to pull. And they realized, this, is, this has got to be a big fish. It's the fight, I'm, I'm just bent back trying to fight this. When it comes out of the water, you wonder if there was two of them. Not big enough for a fight like that. You figure, how's that go? But as we went along, you know, um, we caught some fish and it was because this was before sunset. Fish are pretty active. Uh, a sunrise, sorry, fish are pretty active. So this was, this was a nice trip. What, we, what I found, though, is that um, God's creation is so wonderful. We were out there in the morning, and what we saw just beside the boat, just, I would say, from the edge of the boat to about there, dolphins. And they go, they go in, in groups of 10, it appears, 10 to 12. And they seemed to be so intelligent because they were swimming along with the boat the same speed as the boat and seemed to be engaging us in action. Never had that happen before. So I got to the edge of the boat. I wanted to touch one of them. Then I remember, the life jacket's over there. So I sat back down. <laughs> I let them go. My son-in-law managed to touch one, and my son had a uh, little video, because some of these cameras on your phone now are really good. So there's a video, three minutes of, of dolphins within three feet of, of the edge of the boat. 
So it was, it was, it was, and they, they, uh, they vocalize. They know where they're in the squeaks. You could hear them. They vocalize. I never had that before. There's none in Lake Ontario. I'll tell you that. But it's a good experience. Now, here is something else we saw. We saw sea turtles. They look like big floating rocks. And we saw stingrays. That made me sure I want to stay in the boat. But something else that I saw that I thought was amazing. I know you probably have seen them if you've been out in the sea. A gray whale, one of the largest creatures that God's put on this earth. And we were in this little boat. Remember I told you I could touch both sides with my hands out like this. And then the guy said, he started to speed up. And I'm like, what's happening? He says, something I gathered from him, whale. I look around and I'm seeing, I didn't see anything. Right? But then I saw a spray out of the sea. And it was like from here, as if I was at that end of the church, the boil was about that, that, that end. I never saw anything that size move by itself. You see, dolphins are about 9 foot long and 450 pounds. But this gray whale is, is 50 feet and 36,000 pounds. Across the tail is 12 feet, which I saw come out of the wife a photograph of the tail of a gray whale somewhere in my camera. They travel about 10 miles per hour and they live for, for 70 years. Well, when we got to a certain point, I told the boat to slow down because I'm doing the math in my head. The boat I'm on is probably no more than two tons. The whale is 36 tons. You see what happens if he moves too quickly or in a way we don't agree? And the life jacket was over there, as I said. Well, God is good. He shows us these things that he's created. He says, you know, behold, I make all things new. How much better will it be when God makes all things new? Now, and one more note before I um, change the subject, is that in the middle of the night, in the middle of the week, middle of the night, to me, I'm fast asleep. But I felt the bed do one of these. And I'm thinking, this is, is this a dream or is this real? Anyways, I said nothing till the next morning. I said to someone who were at the uh, breakfast uh, table and I said, did you feel the earthquake last night? And he said, yes. I asked his wife, she said, no. I went back and I said to Heather, did you feel the earthquake last night? She said, no. Okay. We took a little bus tour in the afternoon. And I asked one of the couples, uh, the gen uh, two couples were with us, and I said to the gentleman, did you feel the earthquake last night? He said, yes. The other gentleman I asked, did you feel the earthquake? He says, yes, but the two women said no. <laughs> so I said, when I got back, I said, are men so nervous that we sleep so lightly? <laughs> right? My wife says, yes. Well, as what happened as we, we came back, and within 48 hours, there was a 7.2 earthquake on the Richter scale right where we were. 7.2. Buildings were shaking, people were running, but we were safely back in Canada 48 hours earlier. So I thank God for the experience, but you will not understand how happy I am to be standing here this morning with my family. Well. Um, first of all, let me apologize for that. I see the time is running on and I'm considering how to shorten what I have prepared. I don't know how to do so this morning, but I will try my best. So before um, we go further, let's invite God's presence. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for bringing us here this morning to your house. To share this time together, to enjoy your presence and to worship and to praise your name and to be taught by you. Lord, we thank you. We feel privileged to be in your house today. Lord, bless us. Continue to teach us. Enlighten our minds. But most of all, prepare us, Lord, for your second coming. That when you come, everyone here and everyone who is watching online will be convinced that you are God and prepare themselves for your return. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What I am... The title this morning says The Struggle Within. But I believe the struggle is also a struggle 
outside, inside and outside. And the more I read what I was preparing, I wondered about its contents and its meaning. And at one point I considered, you know, change the subject and get another verse. But it came to my mind that it wasn't me who made the choice. So I have not got the right or power to change it. I have to accept what's placed before me. In the world we live in today, there are, we have a great deal of uncertainty. We hear so many things in the news on a daily basis that we're not quite sure where we are in history, except we know that his coming must be soon. When we read in Revelation chapter 2, as we heard read today, today we, there's two things that are in that passage that are important. Two things that came to me as important, and I hope that you may feel the same way today as well. First of all, we learn, we fall from grace when we allow any other authority than Jesus Christ to rule in our lives. Would you agree? Okay, I know I was away and I came back with some heat with me, but I'm sure the church is not that cold. You must have, uh, you can listen to what this says, and look at the verse we've read, and ask a question. If you agree with this or not, we fall from grace when we allow any other authority than Jesus Christ to rule our lives. Amen? Of course. Another part to this particular verse that we've read. God's church is weakened by rebellion against his establishment when we rebel. And we only at that time reflect the rebellion that was in heaven. That's a longer one. It's a longer one. This is what's evident in the verses we read. Evident in the verses we read. If there's one thing we can agree on, when we look at the churches in Revelation, that there is nothing new under the sun. We can see that no matter where we are as a church, the church before us has had this experience. The church before us has had this experience through history. Whatever we may be facing is a repeat of what God's church has already gone through before at any point in our history. I can imagine that for some of us we say, well, we've heard that before, this is repetitive, but here's the thing. When we are taught by God, God repeats things because we have a difficult time learning. A lifetime of study is insufficient, but because of His grace. The whole Bible is a repetition. Because, as I've said before, we, we, we have a, a... You know, when we go to school, they give us homework. Because what's in class is not sufficient. And I, I, I wasn't... I didn't like homework when I was young. I thought if I put in the hours at school, I should be free the rest of the day. But it was necessary for me to repeat what I've learned to be able to have it seated in my mind that I could progress. I'm sure we're all the same in that respect. That's why we spend so much time in school. In our, we're in school, I guess, from ages, uh, what is it, four now until uh, mid-20s. That's, that's a lot of time to be in school. A lot of time to be in school. But here's the thing, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible always comes back to the same point. We look at the message of the churches and realize that on both the prophetic and devotional levels, the letters to the seven churches were essentially saying the same thing. Every story, every chronicle, every prophecy of the Bible comes back to the same point. It's because God's perspective is that we need to learn, to remember, and to grow. There's one thing that we have to know. And God, in every page of Scripture, reminds us and tries to drive that message home. The whole Bible is aimed at saving God's children. 
which we are if we forget. The whole Bible is geared to teach and to share that you and I belong with our Father in His family. That's what it is about. Salvation for humanity. God has been telling this message for so many years, over and over again. Like some people say, well, we heard the Bible says, people say, well, where is the change since our fathers fell asleep? Because the message is being repeated, because we need to have that message that Christ is the Savior of the world and died for you and me. You know, it takes a lifetime to read the scriptures before we get it. And even more time for it to sink in. But you and I can thank God that he's not willing to give up on us despite the slow students we are. God always makes the point that his patience and his mercy endure it for how long? Forever. That's good news for you and me because we need that time to go where we need to be. We don't need to be here in this world. We need to be in the world made new with our Father and the family to which we belong. That's the point of the Bible, rescue. The song says, rescue who? The perishing, because that's what we are. We are. If we look at that church in Thyatira, we want to emphasize a few things about this church. So, if we can get that verse either in your Bible or on the screen, we're going to be looking again at Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to look at starting at verse 18 again. This is a long letter, the longest one written to the churches. Now, like all letters to the churches, there's always one or two points, main points, that they would like to bring out. You see, with this church we know something. Let's look at the verse again, verse 18 of uh, chapter 2. And to the angel of the church in Tyre, I write, these things saith who? The Son of God. Which one? Just in case you're, you're trying to find out which one, it says, him who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like brass. Just in case there's a question of who we're speaking about. You know when you go through the customs of the airport, in some countries they need to take your photograph to see if it matches. You know, um, my son, he wore a ball cap. And he says, take off the cap and take the sunglasses off so we can see who you are. Make sure your face matches your photograph. So we know who you are. In this situation, it's told, just in case you're not quite sure, it is he who has eyes, a flame of fire, and feet like fine brass. He speaks to this church, he says, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and patience, and thy works, and the last more than the first. So this church is an active church. It wasn't a church that wasn't doing anything. Do you, you realize that? An active church. Recognized for his work and his charity. The church was getting things done. And we're told, instead of slowing down, this church increased in pace over time. It got a great reputation for the things that it did. Instead of losing its zeal, it grew in, in passion. Now a word she said here about the kinds of service that we're trying to talk about when it comes to the church. Because you see, <coughs> excuse me, there was good works being done. And sometimes we, we, ex we uh, exchange active and good in terms of how we view works. And I'll clarify that in this way. Sometimes at church we have lots of activities. Lots of activities. Referring to some things I've seen as I've driven past churches as time to time, you see they have outside has bulletins, boards, you know, some lit up from behind, some are changed every week. But sometimes you see things like this, um, curling for Christ on Sunday morning. You've seen, I've seen one of these ones. I've seen one, bowling for blessings. They're active, 
But is it the activity that the church should be doing? There is one in Vancouver, the sign went up says, Jogging for Jesus. Bible Trivia Wednesday. But here is the thing I'd like to point out. It isn't that the church was active by doing things like this, but more things for the salvation of souls. A ministry. Personal ministry. Right, Brother Hector? Very important. What is your activity? Is your activity just something to say you're busy? Or is it something that we're instructed to do to spread the gospel to all creatures? What is, what's our activity? You see, God was commending the good work of the church, not just the activity of the church. Now, I'm not saying that these activities may are, are bad, because we need to do things too that keep us together. But our focus must be on the instructions that God has given us. Amen? Not sure everybody agrees with that. <laughs> but the instructions God's given us should take precedence over just plain activity. Would you agree? Amen. I don't want to feel like I'm alone here this morning. You see, um, uh, when I read this uh, and put it together and read it again, I kept saying, do I have enough here to explain what I'm talking about? And I'm hoping that where I fall short, the Spirit fills in for you. But the thing is, the point is that being active is not the same as doing, as following God's instructions. Being active. One of the things that points this out is the word used in the translation prior to the English translation, it's in Greek. And it means labors, works, and tasks. That's the difference. You see, God's not impressed so much with our programs and activities. He's impressed by what we do as a church the duties, the programs that will bring someone to salvation, that will edify his name, that will glorify the Savior, those are the things that are important. Now, again, I'm not saying we shouldn't have social activities, because as a family, we do have social time. What's our focus on what we do? See, our ministry should be inside and outside, encouraging the saints that are here and garnering some that are not yet inside. God loves ministry and those devoted to it. But you know, it doesn't always run smoothly. The reason it doesn't run smoothly is because the enemy moves in an effort to unseat anything that God's people want to do. And that you will find if you look for the verses referring to the church in Pergamos. You see, what happened is here that there were those among the group that were determined, determined to upset the apple cart, for lack of a better expression. And we see that in Thyatira, it is not much different. You see, if we look Later on in verse 20, it says, Notwithstanding, this is verse, on the screen, verse 20, do we have that? It says, Notwithstanding, if you have it in your Bibles, I have a few things against thee. In other words, things aren't going smoothly. Despite the good things, there are some things that require attention. He says, because you have suffered, caused, allowed Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants and to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. It seems uncharacteristic to bring her name in this part of the Bible. This is a long time ago she lived. What does this mean? Now, there's no one in here wearing a name tag marked Jezebel. And if you are, I haven't noticed it yet. It's not about an individual, right? It's about an attitude and an action undertaken by a group, 
or individuals. It says, if we look at who Jezebel is, um, we have to look at the Old Testament. And that will bring us to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings, 1 Kings. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 16. And you have to um, bear with me because I'm trying to shorten this, seeing the time. I realize it's almost time for us to go. But here it is. Let's look at this at, at just a, a minute here uh, of time. What about Jezebel that makes her name appear in this part of the Bible? And we look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 16. And let's look at verse um, 29. Verse 29. And in the 38th, 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel 20 and 2 years. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all the kings that were before him. What did he do? Now, here's what happens in verse 31 that gives you an idea of why her name is mentioned. It says, And came to pass, and that he said, Being the thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took a wife. Who? Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He married Jezebel and altered his direction. Altered his direction. We see what happens in verse 32. He reared up an altar in Baal, in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Inside the house of God, he's brought something that doesn't belong. And they have made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord's anger than all the kings that were before him. All the kings that were before him. His starting move was to marry Jezebel. Bringing her into the house of the Lord, into the family of God, without reason. We go a little bit further and we want to look a little bit more about, about what she has done. And we look a little bit further, I think we're going to look a little bit further in Kings. You see, here's the thing about what Ahab knew. Jezebel was a son of a, a daughter of a pagan uh, God, a king. From the house of Israel, he knew that was a problem. But he disregarded what we refer to as better judgment. Disregarded better judgment. He brought things into Israel that did not belong. One of them being Jezebel. You know, if we go to chapter 21, I want to look in the same book of 1 uh, Kings. And we're going to look at verse 5 down to verse 8. So this is 1 Kings uh, 21. And here's what happens. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, Why is your spirit so sad? Why won't you eat? What's upset you that you won't even eat? What's the problem? What's wrong? She says to him. And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give my vineyard. Naboth wouldn't give him what belonged to Naboth, and he got so upset, he wouldn't even eat. Now he was the king. He had everything that could be given to a king, but here it was, he wanted something belonging to somebody else. And when he couldn't get it, he wouldn't even eat. On my trip, we had a two-year-old that was like that. 
We put ketchup on the wrong place in the plate, she wouldn't eat the rest of it. But she was two years old. He's a king. Jezebel says to him in verse 7, You're the king. What's the problem? You are the king. She, and then she, she says, uh, Arise, get up and eat, and don't worry about it. I will get you the vineyard from Naboth. Right? Here's the head of the house who is sulking. His wife says, I'll look after it. What's important here that I wanted to bring out, though, is the assumption of power by Jezebel. You see what I, where I'm going? The, the assumption of power. She says, look, I'll see, I'll tell you how things will go. I will run how it will, it will, it will be. You're the king, but take a back seat because I have taken over being in control. What happened here is, remember now, she's the daughter of a pagan king now taking control of the family of Israel. Do you see why this relates to Revelation? A foreign entity, a foreign power taking control or disrupting the family of God. That's why she's referred to. So what did she do? To let you know she's in charge. To confirm that she is running the show. In verse 8, she wrote letters in Ahab's name. <laughs> I, I find that to be, to, I mean, just picture it that he is the king and she's taken over writing and sending his name to documents because he can't do that. She sealed the letters to the elders. And she spread false information about Naboth so that he could be killed and his property be taken. How about that? How about the person in charge of the king is against the family of the king? Naboth was accused of cursing God. And because of those accusations, he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. Again, just to point out, she took control of the family of God. She took authority that did not belong to her. But more than that, Ahab gave up the authority given to him. No wonder Elijah had to destroy the prophets of Jezebel, 450 of them. You see, because even though God saw the works of Ahab, he knew who his children were. He was the head of the country, but not the head of the hearts of the children of Israel who worship God despite. What about Jezebel? The main characteristic is the assumption of authority that's not rightfully hers. There was no one to transfer power to her. She just took it. And the children of Israel were led astray. Let there be no question about it. In God's church today, there are people who are doing the same things. Today, Jezebel has not left. This is where it gets serious. Because in amongst the children of God, there are those who would like to usurp the authority that belong to them. Those who believe the Bible is not sufficient. Or those who believe, well, there's too much in there, it needs to be changed. To assume authority that does not belong to them. Have mercy. 
They challenge those who want to stay in the family of God on both sides. They challenge every authority that seems to want to correct. They're inside and outside. Remember that the Bible says there's, there's wolf in sheep's clothing, which means they're among the sheep. There's the wolf you can see and the one you can't. But, they are, but what they do is the same. You know, how does this work? If we look at this, the, 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 this church today, we realize there's people who were here not long ago who no longer attend. Isn't that right? I've been here long enough to remember faces that should be here. But when Jezebel works to change minds and hearts to take authority, it is without discrimination. They will take whoever is available. So the thing is, the struggle inside is to hold on to what God has told us to do. It's to stick with his words where written, not to want to add or to subtract or to take authority to make a change. This is what this, this message is about today. You see, God establishes authority over his church and his people. In the Bible, there is authority given. The Bible talks about our civil government. It talks about our employers being, uh, uh, having authority. It talks about the, the authority in the wife, husband being the head of the home in many verses. Parents over children. And also in the church. With every one of those people in, in authority in any of these situations, there comes a responsibility, a reckoning. You know, when I was reading um, in, in um, I can't remember the book now, it was to do with, with families anyway. And it says that, you know, when God provided that there would be a head of a home, a husband with an authority, he also said that if that authority is breached, his responsibility is severe. Do you realize that? So when you want to assume being head of the house, remember that there is a responsibility that goes along with it. It's not just, uh, you know, um, I hate to refer to a certain president who wants to have his own military parade to make himself happy. <laughs> but you see, it's not just the parade. It's the responsibility. And the problem with breaching that responsibility, in every case in, in the Bible, we see the Bible upholding authority, but also upholding responsibility. I'm watching the time when I'm trying to get through and not weary the saints. But this is something that speaks to me as well, and I'm hoping that you can walk with me just another few minutes. If we go to the book of Romans, verse 13, Romans 13, Romans chapter 13, and we look at something about authority, chapter, in verse 1, in verse 1 of Romans 13. This is how we talk about authority. God wants us to know about authority also among, on, on, on the face of the earth. Let every soul, every person be subject to higher powers. There's somebody who's going to be above you somewhere along the line. For, for there is no power higher than God. But the powers that are given are ordained by God. He set up kings and he can take them down. Do we keep the laws of our country? Sure. As long as they don't, they don't contradict the laws of God. Of course. What we know is this. There's no higher authority than God. But it also tells us we should not rebel against the authority or take it away from God, or try to take it away from God, because that's wrong. 
liberals say, well, the only person I have to listen to is God. But God says, look, there are kings below you setting up laws that I put there. God established authorities so society would have order. In the Old Testament, something that young people might not want to hear is that a child who was disobedient could be taken outside the city and stoned. Do you realize that? Because God wants a kingdom of order. And if we all decided to do things our own way, how much order would there be? If we look again at the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm trying to get through these. Please forgive me for taking too long, but I want to share as much as I can in the next five minutes. Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 5. Servants, obey your masters according to the flesh with respect or fear and trembling and singleness of heart, which means diligently. If you're employed to do a job at a company, do the job you're paid for. Don't take the early coffee break or tea break or, or decide you're only doing seven hours work for an eight-hour job or six hours work for a seven-hour job. Right? This is not with eye service. That means don't make it just look as if you're doing what you're asked to do. You must do it. But it says, do it as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Authority. We know something about our world. How difficult some things are that we struggle with. We live in a difficult time. Matthew says, in these days, perilous times will come. And we live in an age where we talk about me first, what I need, and never about others. Looking back at the letter that we looked at uh, in Revelation, we should not foster a spirit of rebellion or a spirit of destructive criticism. We try to justify to ourselves why we're right, why we should be doing things our way and no one else's. But we realize that in Revelation 2 it brought condemnation to those who took a different path, who tried, like Jezebel, to assume the authority to make the change. In these last days, as we say, perilous times will come. So choose this day whom you will serve. We thank God for his mercy because he has not left us in despair in these difficult times. Because we struggle with so many things in our lives as human beings on a daily basis relationships, employment, survival, all these things we struggle with and sometimes spiritually we struggle and we try to bend the truth to fit our reality. We're advised not to do that. You see, we have to resist every temptation to leave God's work behind or to leave His truth If we do rebel, we're following the example of one particular person, the original rebellion leader. That's not what we want. God in his mercy has found in verse 25 of the same Revelations 2. If we go back there and we'll wind up looking at this last at this one more time. Revelations chapter 2. Verse 24, he says, For those who have not gone the way of Lucifer, who have overcome, who have kept the word, I will give them the morning star. 
the sign of redemption, the recovery. If you do what he says and give in to his will, understanding that he is the creator who has a plan to save you, the morning star is your reward. The sight of Jesus coming back is your reward. We're told in the same verse, in verse 25, it says, hold fast, hold on with two hands. I will tell you something, when I was on that boat and it started to rock, I held on with two hands. When you see the danger, you see the need to hold on with two hands. We live in a dangerous world. We live in dangerous times. We live in times that means that we have to focus on his truth, on his word, on the things he's given us to do. He says, hold on, keep his work to verse to the end and not to give up. And that's why I refer this morning to a struggle, because it's not easy for any of us sitting in these views to say on every day, you know, I'm not worried about what's happening. It's because there are things that concern us, and only our Heavenly Father can provide the answer. All Scripture comes back to this point, as I was mentioning before. The point is that in this world, only direction from Jesus can save us. Only by living on what He has written in His books, is a salvation to, to be attained. We should never let go of what we are holding, never let go hold fast, it says in Revelations. So what do we do? I should do what God has given me to do that makes a difference in this world. To share what's given to me, this gift, this wonderful gift of salvation, to do my part and to live according to what I have been taught. Submit to the things that are of the Bible. Submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. Submit under Him to all the things He requires of us and never put self first. Let not Jezebel affect your life. Let not your, 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 your focus be taken to the left or to the right, but to maintain your focus and your face on Him who saves us all. If you have never surrendered to Christ, today is the time to start. There is no time like that. There is not tomorrow. It's not given to you tomorrow. But today is the day you say, Lord, let me make this commitment to you because I see how necessary it is for me to obtain eternal life. If you feel helpless about this. Sometimes we have days that are so tough that we feel that it is it's outside of our powers to make the effort. But God's not a harsh dictator. He wants his children to come to him. He wants us to understand that no matter what environment we are in, he is willing to save. Whatever your conditions are this morning or now it's afternoon, the only cure is Jesus. The only thing that will heal everything that's wrong with us is the power of Jesus and the focus on him. God repeats this in the Bible so we can learn. Because we're not fast at picking up on these things. Today is a good day, would you say, to refocus? Today is a good day to reestablish. Today is a good day to make a stand. Today is a good day to avoid sinking deeper. Today is a day to look up. Today is the day you says yes. If I have forgotten, Lord, help me to surrender and to give my life to you. We've taken a lot of what I prepared out, but I want to close by saying this. There is no time like the present. And whether you feel strong in your faith or not, there is always a need to recommit. There's always a need to take a stand again to remind ourselves what's important, what's necessary, and what we should be looking at this time in our lives. Would you agree? If today you want to commit to remove from your sphere of life any touch of Jezebel, to focus on Jesus Christ and Jesus alone, could you stand with me this morning? Could you stand with me? And if you feel the need to come forward, that's even greater. Because it means we're all together on this. We realize that the song says this world 
is full of sin. And the only way for us to be rescued is through His grace, His mercy, and His kindness, His blessings, His forgiveness. So to commit this morning, step forward and share this space with me. Join me that I'm not alone. Come because it's serious to you to connect with the Savior, to recognize our own weaknesses, our own faults, our own problems. That we have no way of getting over these things except for His mercy and His grace. That we are not capable of doing that. So in coming forward, you're saying, Lord, I recognize that I need you more than anything else. I need you, Lord, because I realize the danger. I realize that whatever it is that may have gone wrong, Lord, you can let, let go of that. I don't need to take that with me because you are coming with me on the rest of my walk. What a feeling it is when you can hold his hand. So this morning, if there's anybody else who wants to come forward, just let those who are for here know they're not alone. That we are marching to Zion, we're marching together. A march is not one person, it is a group. The song says we're marching to Zion. Let us march to Zion confirmed in his love. Is there anyone else who would, I don't want to close too early, I want to see people still moving. If you want to be up here, please come. Please come. We commit together. We start together. We start again. And what we do now, Lord, is we bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the offer you have made to us. You teach us over and over how important it is to hold on and to hold fast. In the very last book of the Bible, you remind us how important it is. As you said in Genesis, you prepared a way, and in Revelation, you says, hold on to what I've given to you. You repeat for us, Lord, because we need to learn. We thank you, Lord, for making the offer. Help us to grow to accept. Help us to recognize and understand what it is that you've given to us. Help us to not be led astray. Help us to focus on Jesus and what he has done for us. And Lord, more than anything else, when you come again, we want to be among those who says, here is our Lord, we have waited for him. Blessed is his arrival. And for those who came forward, Lord, and for those who are standing, with those who are committed, touch each heart, reminding us of what it is that you're doing for us. Remind us that you are near to us, close to us, Help us to hold on fast until the end. This we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.